Welcome, congregation, to our morning worship service. A special word of welcome to those who are joining with us this morning as visitors. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made, and therefore we will join ourselves together. We will rejoice, and we will be glad in it. Our call to worship this morning comes from God Himself uh, through His Word, as we find it in Psalm 147, verses 1 and 2. There the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And so our God is a God of grace and a God of mercy, and as we have received and continue to receive that grace and mercy, it motivates us to praise Him And so let's call upon his name in prayer as we begin to do so this morning. Our Father in heaven, we pause from the activities of our lives here on this Lord's Day morning, and we reflect upon the majesty that is displayed in the realm of creation. Uh, The heavens and the earth testify to your greatness, but we also reflect upon your work of redemption. Uh, You have gathered together your people, you have healed them, And that includes us. And so we come this morning, and also, Lord willing, by your good providence this evening, to sing praises to our God. We thank you for reminding us through your word that this is a good exercise in which we are about to engage. But we know it is an exercise for which we need your blessing. And so we ask that your spirit would rest upon us and prepare our hearts and also focus our minds. Uh, warm our affections, uh, that we might employ our being uh, to bring honor and glory to you, our God. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll begin our service with a song of praise, turning together to selection 147b. Uh, We'll stand, if able, as we sing the first four stanzas, stanzas one through four from 147b.
especially when we come into the presence of God as a congregation to worship Him, we do so acknowledging that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heaven and the earth. And our God greets us this morning with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we begin a new week uh, on this Lord's Day, we have the wonderful opportunity of hearing our Lord speak to us. Uh, at this point in the service from the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus chapter 20. And as you turn there, we are reminded for the purpose of God's giving us the law. There is, of course, the purpose that it reveals our sin and our need of a Savior, but there is also the purpose that this shows how we are to sacrifice our lives as instruments of praise and thankfulness and gratitude to our God, for the redemption or the salvation or the deliverance that he has sovereignly accomplished and applied unto our hearts and unto our lives. So with that in mind, uh, we listen to our God speak to us through his law in Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates." For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And our Lord summarized these Ten Commandments with two. The first and the great commandment is that we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto the first, we are called to love our neighbor as ourself. Now we'll respond to hearing our God speak to us uh, by singing from selection 130B. We'll remain seated while we sing the three stanzas of 130B.
using the song of Scripture to both express the reality of confession, but also the hope of forgiveness, we then have the opportunity to hear our Lord speak to us, assuring us of the pardon of our sins. And our text for pardon this morning is taken from the psalm of which we've just sung, Psalm 130. We look especially at verse 7 and 8, where the church is encouraged as follows, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for there is forgiveness with the Lord. The psalmist continues, For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. I've said this in the past, but I say it again this morning. All of Scripture, of course, is inspired, uh, but sometimes we overlook the, the smaller words of Scripture, but those small words are often emphatic, and with their emphasis, they often bring great comfort. Uh, Notice uh, that the Lord, with him, is abundant redemption. So the Holy Spirit inspired the psalmist to include that word abundant, an an overflowing, an all-sufficient provision of redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. All his iniquities. Behold the grace and the mercy of our God. And let us then call upon his name together in congregational prayer. Lord God Almighty, who is a God like unto you, who not only creates all things and upholds all things in your sovereign power, but also comes down in your grace and your mercy and establishes a relationship with us, a covenant of grace, including the provision of all of the benefits of salvation. Lord, our desire is that we might rightly know you, and rightly knowing you, that we might appreciate and acknowledge your majesty and your supremacy, that all of our trust and our hope and our confidence might be based upon you and your promises, and we desire, too, that we would worship you that the praises that come forth from the very depths of our soul uh, would ascend up into the heavens to your majestic throne room, and that you would look upon us and the worship that we bring this morning and also this evening as it is brought to you through Jesus Christ, sanctified by him, and we pray, Father, that you would be glorified and honored for you are God. As we have heard your law read this morning, uh, we do confess our sins. We confess that we do not worship you uh, with absolute purity of heart. We confess that we do not love our fellow human beings perfectly. We confess that many times we are guilty of injustice in how we speak about one another, how we look at one another, Uh, We confess, Father, that sin resides within us. But we don't say these things to despair, but we say these things because we know that you are a God of abundant mercy. And we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And we pray for a blessing upon these spiritual exercises of this day, uh, that our faith might be strengthened, And as our faith is strengthened by your sovereign work, also that the fruits of that faith might become more and more manifest within our lives. We thank you, O God, for all of the goodness that you are within yourself, but also for how you have continually displayed that goodness unto us and unto our children. We thank you that you're a God who does not work in isolation, gathering one here or one there, but you are a God who primarily works along covenantal lines making promises to us and to our children, and we plead upon those promises. We thank you, Father, that our children and our grandchildren, and for some of us, even our great-grandchildren, have received the sign and the seal of your covenant in their baptism. And we ask that you would also add that blessing of the internal work of the Holy Spirit, that their hearts may have been regenerated, and that they would come as they gradually mature to exercise a genuine personal faith. We thank you, Father, for watching over us in this week, uh, for blessing us with measures of health and safety and protection, 
Uh, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity and the strength and also uh, the direction in your word to labor and that way imitating our Heavenly Father. We thank you for our vocations. We ask for a blessing upon them uh, that we might receive our daily bread. And as we ask for our daily bread, we pray too that you would give us spirits of contentment and wisdom that we might you all, use all that we are and all that we have to honor and glorify and to enjoy you. Uh, while we thank you for our health and for the opportunity to work, we recognize that uh, some gather this morning or are in their place of care, grieving or healing. For those who grieve, we think especially of the Kamarek family, uh, Dan and Christy and uh, their children, with the passing of Christy's father. We pray, Father, that you would comfort this family uh, with the gospel truths of eternal life. Uh, we pray for healing for a number of our members, recovering from surgeries or still hospitalized. We lift up in prayer, Lord Rush van Mersbergen. Uh, we thank you for the stability that he has, but we also ask that there might be continued uh, growth and strength and development, uh, that uh, this uh, young son of the congregation of the van Mersbergen family uh, would be able to return home within the next couple days, we ask. We thank, too, of Larry Gullion as he continues to be hospitalized. We thank you for his transfer uh, to Palo Regional Hospital. Uh, we ask that uh, you would continue to bless the uh, IV antibiotics that he receives daily, uh, that he might regain uh, greater measures of health day by day. We pray for healing for those who have undergone recent surgeries. We think of Bill Vermeer. We ask that you would alleviate uh, pain that he experiences and that he might continue to regain also strength and mobility. We thank you, Father, for uh, the recovery of Reverend Pontier after his knee surgery, that he can be with us this morning. Uh, we pray that you would bless him, that he might uh, pick up his labors, and that he might continue to uh, serve well in the kingdom. We thank you, too, for Justin DeYoung's presence here after undergoing uh, shoulder surgery. We ask for healing uh, and uh, a quick recovery, uh, that in due time uh, he might return to work and uh, active uh, labors. Uh, there are others, Lord, who either have undergone recent surgeries or are anticipating procedures, uh, those who have been diagnosed with uh, health conditions. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would bless your people with all that they stand in need of. Uh, we ask for a blessing, too, upon those who are perhaps uh, traveling over this holiday weekend, visiting family or friends in other places, grant them traveling mercies uh, and a time of fellowship with their families. Uh, we rejoice with those who commemorate birthdays. Uh, we rejoice too, Lord, with uh, the uh, families who have recently received children. We thank you for your faithfulness displayed to us in these various areas. Uh, we ask, Lord, for a blessing upon your church. Uh, also here at Covenant, uh, we pray for continued reformation in doctrine and in life, uh, for the clear preaching of the gospel, uh, for a mature understanding of the scriptures. And as we now turn our attention to those scriptures, uh, we ask, Lord, for the work of the Holy Spirit to grant us illumination. We know that the Word is living and powerful, but we know also that our hearts must be opened up that we might gain insight into your word. And so we pray for the proclamation of the word, but also for the reception of that word. And we ask, Lord, that today in this congregation and all throughout this community and all throughout the world, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. This we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We then turn to our song of preparation uh, this morning that is chosen from Selection 73D. If Abel will stand as we sing the five stanzas, all five stanzas of Selection 73D.
As we then turn our attention to the reading of Holy Scripture, in addition this morning to the words of our text, which will be taken from Ecclesiastes 4, verses 1 through 3, we also want to read uh, from Psalm 73. Uh, scripture has an organic unity to it. Uh, scripture, of course, is made up of uh, many passages, uh, but there is a unity within those passages being the product of the mind of one author, that of the Holy Spirit, revealing one truth. Uh, various passages uh, shed light on other passages. So in that connection, we wanted to read this morning from Psalm 73 as it sheds light uh, into the truth of Ecclesiastes 4, 1 through 3. So here now together the reading of the Word of God. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me... My feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment, their eyes bulge with abundance, they have more than heart could wish." They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly. They are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until... I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved. And I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever." For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Just notice how the psalmist is given insight into the activities he sees here on this earth when he considers them from the eternal perspective from heaven. We turn then to the words of our text, Ecclesiastes 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun. And look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there is power, but they have no comforter. Therefore I praise the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still alive. Yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Thus far our reading for now from the Holy Scriptures. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, my wife's grandfather, paternal grandfather, Grandpa Vendyke, had a saying that he would often say, in many ways summarizing passages of Scripture. And the saying went like this, trouble from the womb to the tomb. I can still hear him say it, trouble from the womb to the tomb. And there's truth to that statement. As our own experience testifies, 
Now certainly there are many good things that we enjoy in this life and we ought to enjoy them and give thanks to God for them. But there's also the evidence of many troubles. And Scripture confirms our experience. Uh, Scripture has a realistic perspective on earthly life. And Scripture affirms that there are troubles in this life. And Scripture also confirms that these troubles cause sorrow. This is especially evident in our text this morning from Ecclesiastes 4. The text speaks about oppression and the tears that such oppression causes. Now, we want to be clear in our introduction. In our day especially, if you listen to society and if you listen to culture, uh, there has been and there is much talk about social injustice. And we need to think biblically about these concepts. We need to identify both justice and injustice from the biblical perspective and biblical truth and biblical evaluations. And much of what is alleged to be social injustice is really not injustice. But there's also a danger of overreacting the other way and ignorantly denying the existence of injustice within society. There is injustice within society. And injustice causes sorrow. And the sorrow that can come from injustice can often bring a person or a group of people to the point of despair. And I would submit to you that we're seeing something of that in our own age and in our own culture. Individuals, by and large, are not very optimistic, at least not when you listen to the, uh, the drum of news media. It's doom and it's gloom. And you hear reports uh, of how this is negative and how that is negative and how everything must change for there to be any hope of anything being good. And if you listen too long to the voices of our culture, you might adopt the mentality of verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 4. You might praise the dead who are already dead. Or you might say, you know what would have been the best thing if I had never been born? Well, how are we to evaluate such expressions? If you look at our text, I just want to identify uh, how I arrived at my theme. You'll notice the word Oppression is used a number of times in verse 1. Oppression, oppressed, oppressors. And so that grammatical emphasis drives our theme to identify and deal with this oppression. Notice also that this oppression causes misery. Verse 1 again, tears. Tears that are shed without any comforter. And so we derived at this theme, the misery of the oppressed, and as we take our text and other scriptural passages and shed light into this text, we want to notice, first of all, the cause of their misery, and then secondly, the reaction to their misery, and then thirdly, the hope in their misery. So the misery of the oppressed is what our text sets before us this morning, and we'll notice the cause, the reaction, and then the hope in the midst of this misery. So first of all, then, consider with me the cause of their misery is both the experience of sinful oppression, but then also the absence of effective comfort. The tears of the oppressed is what now Ecclesiastes is looking at. Sinful oppression has always occurred within the human race as it has lived under the sun. Notice that phrase again there in verse 1. And under the sun is a phrase used all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes to represent human life post-fall. After the rebellious actions of Adam and Eve, the first parents of the human race, after they rebelled against God, 
because of the instigation of the devil. All of that, of course, took place underneath the absolute sovereignty of God to accomplish God's purposes. But humanity rebelled against God, and when humanity rebelled against God, a curse was placed upon the entirety of creation. And ever since that day, humanity has lived under the sun and they have lived with the expressions of injustice. And so you can think of the first family and the gross injustice that there was within that first family as Cain lashes out in an act of violence and murders his son. And there you see it. The tears begin to flow from the human race as injustice, as Cain oppresses Abel. And all Throughout human history, that has been the sad and sordid story. You can pick up various narratives in the Old Testament, and you can see the oppression that took place. You can see the violence that is expressed between humanity, and you can almost feel the weight of the tears that continue to be compiled all throughout human history. And of course, it's not just in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well, and in our own experience. And a large reason for the oppression that brings tears is humanity's sinful perversion or twisting, distorting of what we call creational ordinances. There is a certain sanctity. There is a certain value, for example, to human life, to human sexuality, to the expressions of human sexuality uh, within the context of marriage. But what does human society do? It perverts these things. It twists these things. And so we just take one example uh, of oppression that brings great amounts of tears, of uh, the human trafficking and exploitation, which is a result of the perversion of the sanctity of human life and the sanctity of human sexuality. And all throughout the Old Testament, there was also uh, this experience of oppression. The slave was often mistreated by the master. The laborer was often taken advantage of uh, by uh, those who had the wealth. The borrower, uh, at times, was charged an unreasonable amount of interest. Uh, the widow was often neglected. Uh, or even taken advantage of, as was the orphan. And this was done by both the pagan nations, but also by Israel as they apostatized, as they fell away from following God. And the prophets, especially, were given the duty, the responsibility to speak on behalf of God and to bring certain claims of the necessity of justice and also charges of injustice are within this context. And so, uh, a few examples of this taken from the prophet Amos. If you would turn to Amos 3, verse 9, uh, and in the Pew Bible, or a Bible that correlates to the pagination of the Pew Bible, you find this on page 1058. So, Amos is a prophet of God. He's a mouthpiece of God. He's sent to bring a message of God uh, to Israel, to the covenant people, uh, to identify and charge them with the injustice that was taking place within society there and the tears that it was causing. So notice, for example, Amos 3, uh, verse 9 and 10. Proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumults in her midst and the oppressed within her, for they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. And notice the result uh, of such injustices is the judgment of God. Therefore, verse 11 says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you and your palaces shall be plundered. There is always a note of irony in the chastising judgments of God. The Lord God says, basically, you want to oppress? you will be oppressed. You want to do violence? You will experience violence. You want to exploit? You will be exploited. You can drop down to verse 1 uh, of Amos 4 and notice the graphic imagery as Amos speaks. 
Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Now, Amos is not talking to the actual cows. He's talking to individuals who oppress the poor as the rest of the verse makes clear. You who are in the mountains of Samaria who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn in his holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks pointing to the brutality of the exile that would be experienced by an apostate Israel. Sinful oppression. If you go back to Ecclesiastes 4, the misery of those who are oppressed is amplified by the absence of effective comfort. The tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. Now you can think, and this is not in connection uh, with the wonderful voices of a little one that we just heard, you could think of the tears of a child, the tears of an infant. The cry of an infant usually triggers the action of a mother or of a caregiver. The cries of an infant usually bring about the provision of comfort. But here Solomon is saying, the oppressed cry, but there is no comforter because of the impotency of fellow humans. Now family and friends can bring about a certain solace, but Family and friends are usually powerless to turn the tide of social oppression. And not only the impotency of fellow humans, it is usually true that on the side of those who are doing the oppressing, and again here, uh, this, is, this should not be interpreted as a stamp of approval on Marxism. We need to take, you know, the political theories of the last 150 years and also of our own day. We're not advocating for Marxism. We're not dividing all of society into the oppressed and the oppressors and then encouraging, identifying uh, certain points of transition. We're just speaking biblically here. Those who are doing the oppressing whether that be in social realms, whether that be in political realms, whether that be in financial realms or institutional realms, they have the power. And political action, and the history of politics bears this out, political action in and of itself can never deal ultimately with the dilemma of oppression. Think of the amount of resources that are spent to alleviate oppression. And can it ultimately accomplish the complete elimination of oppression? No. Why not? In part because those who would seek through political means to alleviate oppression are often sadly characterized by being guilty of oppression. And also because political action in and of itself, while again can have a certain benefit, never gets to the heart of the matter, which is the heart. So you can think, for example, of an abusive relationship. Well, the civil magistrate can step in and can offer some protection. But the civil magistrate cannot change the heart. 
You can think perhaps also of the exploitation of human trafficking. And and we're wonderfully thankful for all of those who are engaged in law enforcement as they seek to prevent such things. And while the perpetrators can be locked up, and they should be locked up, the law enforcer cannot change the heart of the one who is engaged in human trafficking. And Solomon looks at all of this. And what's his reaction? Well, that's our second point. In verse 2, I praise the dead who are already dead, more than the living who are still alive. Yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has never seen the evil work that is done under the sun. He makes an observation in compassionate wisdom. I want to be clear, verse 2 is not just the ranting of a bitter old jaded man. You know, there are such persons, and not just bitter old jaded men, but also bitter old jaded women. Solomon is not one of those. He has a great measure of wisdom, of perception, of understanding, and he's engaged in a certain observation of society, of human life under the sun. And in addition to his consideration, notice there verse 1, I returned and considered all the oppression. I carefully inspected what was going on, and I properly reflected upon what was going on. Solomon did so with wisdom, but also with a heart of compassion. 1 Kings 4 verse 29 records this, God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. But now notice this also, and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore he he was not unaffected he didn't just coldly observe in some type of scientifical evaluation and just bring forth data and a report and say well here it is yeah it seems to be some oppression under the sun actually it seems to be a lot of oppression under the sun he was a man who had both wisdom and compassion You might say it this way, he understood what was going on in human society and it broke his heart. And I just want to make this point of application. There there should be something of that balance in us as the Christian church when we look upon human society and when we see evidence of oppression, when we see uh, the brokenness uh, of human interaction when we see that things are not as they were designed to be, when we see evidence of the curse upon human society, we should have biblical understanding, biblical wisdom. We should evaluate what's going on from biblical truth, rightly identifying that which is really injustice, and also correcting uh, when individuals say that there is injustice that is not actually injustice. So we must interact with our culture from the the biblical knowledge and understanding that we have. But we should also be individuals who have hearts of compassion. And does this not imitate our Savior himself? Who often looked upon the human plight, and now of course there is the distinction that he's the Savior. We are not the Savior, but in many ways we do follow and imitate our Lord and our Savior. And Jesus Christ often looked upon the human plight And he was moved to compassion. He was moved to sorrow. Especially when he saw those who were oppressed. And there should be something of that in ourselves. But notice that Solomon, as he looks with compassionate wisdom, he has a tendency to despise life because of the perpetual injustice. That's what I want to emphasize, that this was perpetual, that it went on and on and on and on, day after day, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennium after millennium. Human life seems to be a constant, so to speak, broken record, and the older individuals in the congregation get the analogy. Uh, But just going on and on and on, I guess the contemporary analogy would be, you know, a song that's on an endless loop cycle. 
Human misery, human misery, human misery, oppression, 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 tears, tears, tears. And Solomon says, it's constant. And because it's constant, and because it impacted his compassionate heart to the point where he was moved to have sorrow, he says, you know what? It would appear that the dead have it better. It would appear that those who have never been born perhaps have it the best. And I emphasize those words, appears, because as the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes shows, but especially in the conclusion, but it's sprinkled all throughout, Solomon is not ultimately despising of life. But he is identifying he is identifying the pressure of oppression and sorrow and the weight that it brings upon the living. Now we could say it this way, to summarize from Psalm 73, verse 26, my flesh and my heart fell. But you know Psalm 73, verse 26 doesn't end with just that statement. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And many have said that those are the two most powerful words in Scripture and the two most powerful words in life. But God. My flesh and my heart fail in this context as I consider the tears of the oppressed that perpetually fall. But there's something more to the picture. And that brings us into our third point, the hope in their misery. Now you might look at verses 1, 2, and 3 and say, where is the hope? And I would acknowledge that if all there was in Scripture was Ecclesiastes 4, 1 through 3, it would appear to be rather hopeless. But of course, Ecclesiastes 4, 1, 2, and 3 are Scripture, but they are not the entirety of Scripture. And using context, the immediate context of the book of Ecclesiastes and the larger context of the Old Testament and the large context of the entirety of Scripture, uh, there is hope. Why, why does Solomon identify this misery? to help us understand that there is a divine purpose. There is a divine purpose to recognizing the miserable plight of humanity under the sun. First of all, to point out that the misery that we so often experience is a result of human rebellion. So for immediate context, look, for example, at Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. Because we might look around at this world and go, what's going on? Everything seems to be broken. What, what's the reason for this? Well, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29 says, truly this only have I found, that God made man upright, but they, that is man, humanity, have sought out many schemes. So you notice what Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 is saying. There's something that's broken. But it's not God. It's not God that's broken. And it's not God's order that is broken. What is broken is that humanity has sought out many schemes. Humanity has devised perversions. Humanity has, has run amok, so to speak. Humanity has rebelled. And so the human plight of oppression, the human plight of suffering, the human plight of perpetual suffering is not the result of something that God did that is broken, but rather something that humanity has done that is broken. And when we recognize that, it also points out uh, that there is this encouragement to have an eternal perspective. 
when you look all around on a 360 degree radius, so to speak, at a horizontal level, everywhere Solomon looks, he sees oppression. Everywhere he looks, figuratively for sure, maybe even literally, everywhere he looks, he sees tears. He goes to this part of the town, there's tears. He goes to that part of the town, there's tears. He sees the, the slave mistreated, he sees tears. He sees the, the widow suffering, uh, just so I make it through the day, he sees tears. He sees the, the orphan, he sees tears. And, and we also, don't we see this? You look here and uh, there's a troubled relationship. You look there and it's broken. You look over to that family and they have their concerns and their heartaches. You look in this part of the country or that part of the country and you see tears on a 360 degree radius when you scan the human race at a horizontal level as it lives underneath the sun. I dare say you could go and pick up a daily newspaper and you would read negative reports, reports of situations in life, the barbaric actions of one person against another person or one group of people against another group of people, and you can see something of the distress on a horizontal level. Well, what then is the hope? The hope is this, that there is another perspective than the horizontal perspective. Because when you look all around you and all you see are tears and misery and oppression and despair, where else can you look? You can look up. I would have lost heart, the psalmist says, and now I'm paraphrasing, if all I could see was that which was around me. But I looked up. I looked up. And there is God, God himself. I want to borrow the words of a commentator who says, by thoroughly disgusting us with the world and by making us realize its absolute vanity, God means to draw us to himself. I want to read that again. But remember, Solomon is looking around. He's seeing oppression everywhere. He's seeing tears everywhere. He says, you know what? Maybe the dead have it best, and maybe those who have never been born have it even better. Why this picture? By thoroughly disgusting us with the world and by making us realize its absolute vanity, God means to draw us to himself because there is divine comfort. Not in an overly mystical type of a way, but Tuesday morning, it was Tuesday morning, when I was in my study working on this sermon preparation, when I read verse 1, then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun, and look the tears of the oppressed. And then this phrase, they have no comforter. And it's repeated twice, notice that, they have no comforter. I thought to myself, well, what about Isaiah 40, verse 1? If you turn there, if you're so inclined, look at what Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, and as soon as you get there, you'll recognize the passage probably. Maybe you already have it memorized and you knew exactly where we were going. Ecclesiastes 4, they have no comforter. Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Do you see the contrast? They have no comforter, the book of Ecclesiastes says, and yet the prophet Isaiah gets this commission from the Lord. Go and cry out, comfort, yes, comfort, Jerusalem. Your warfare is over. Your sins are forgiven. Well, what's the bridge between these two apparent contradictory statements? How in the midst of misery 
can one say there is comfort? Is it not entirely bound up in the provision of a Savior? Isn't the the bridge, so to speak, isn't the way to get from Ecclesiastes 4 verse 1 to Isaiah 40 verse 1 through the truth, for example, of Luke 2? Verses 10, 11, and 14, where a message is given to shepherds. And you might say that shepherds would have been among the oppressed. These were individuals who were at the very bottom of the social caste system. These were individuals who had to give all that they had to eke out a daily existence of the bare necessities. And what is the message that is given to them in the evening hours as they're watching their flocks? Luke 2, verse 10, 11, and 14. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of joy. In the context of the human plight of oppression, in the context of all of the tears that had been shed in Jerusalem and the outlying areas, including Bethlehem, and in the entirety of the world, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which be for all the people. And and what are those good tidings? That there's a new governor coming to town? That the political parties are getting aligned rightly and we are somehow going to bring about the kingdom of heaven here on earth? No, it's not so much along those lines. There is born to you this day a Savior in the city of David who is Christ the Lord. And then that beautiful refrain that breaks forth in the majesty of the heavens as the holy angels with a zeal that cannot be restrained come forth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Do you know what it says after that? On earth, peace. Goodwill toward men. And so you have the oppressed and the tears that flow from their eyes in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1, and you have the message that is given to the prophet in Isaiah 40, comfort, yes, comfort my people, and it's all bound up in the fact that although we look at the horizontal level and we see universal misery, we look up by faith and we see a Savior who brings about the forgiveness of sins and peace. And it will always be true. And this does not take away from our obligation to seek the well-being of the city in which we are called, but it will always be true, this side of glory, that there will be oppression under the sun. But thanks be to God that there is a coming new heavens and a new earth. According to the days according to the words, rather, of 2 Peter 3, verse 13, in which righteousness dwells. You see that contrast, too? Under the sun, oppression. Above the sun, so to speak, or beyond the sun. Because what happens with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? The sun, S-U-N, is no longer necessary. And in that new heaven and that new earth, Righteousness dwells. Righteousness, which eliminates all injustice and all oppression. And then remember the words of Revelation 21, verse 4. Based upon the provision of a Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1, has all the oppressed with tears in their eyes. Revelation 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear. From their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. So Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1 has to give way to Isaiah 40, verse 1, because of Luke 2, verse 10 and 11. Thanks be to God, this is our hope, this is our confidence. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Once again this morning, we thank you for the realism, the biblical realism that Scripture has. 
We thank you that it does not just simply come and sprinkle a pixie dust of vain hopes uh, into our hearts, but that it comes with profound truth. That it speaks clearly identifying the painful reality of oppression and the tears that such oppression causes. And we ask that you would give us hearts of compassion for those who are oppressed. And may we, as your people in the land in which you have placed us, seek the well-being of the city, including advocating for justice for the oppressed. But may our hearts also be drawn up to the very heavens, to God himself. And may we find comfort in the provision of a comforter and the hope of eternal life and the prospect of a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, in which there should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. So we ask for a blessing to that end, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our song of dedication is Selection 450. Uh, We'll stand as we sing the four stanzas, all four stanzas of Selection 450. Then afterwards you may be seated again.
At this point in the service, uh, the deacons will receive our morning tithes and offerings, which are given for seminarian support. After that collection is taken up, we'll stand to sing our doxology, the third stanza of selection 181.
And now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.